Hello everyone, I'm Shabri. Me along with Ali would be presenting our research work for today's talk. It's called STEMSEC and it stands for Spatiotemporal Embeddings for Instant Segmentation in Videos. As the name suggests, uh, it's an algorithm for performing multi-object segmentation in video clips. We'll structure today's talk um, in two parts. In the first part, I'll explain um, what the task of instant segmentation is and the basic motivation for developing this algorithm. We'll also uh, talk about some of the existing works that perform instant segmentation in videos and briefly go through some of their disadvantages. In the second part, Ali would uh, go in depth with STEMSEG and explain uh, how we model the problem of instant segmentation and also walk you through some of the results that, uh, that we have. Let's first take a look at the problem of segmentation and see why segmentation is important. So any autonomous system such as robot would uh, perform visual perception with the help of a mounted camera. And often the feeds from these cameras, or rather always the feeds from these cameras are either images or clips. And uh, the a primary task that these systems have to do uh, is to detect objects in its immediate vicinity so that it's un, it's aware of it of the surroundings and the most basic form of object detection is uh, in the form of bounding boxes which you can see in figure a here so the task uh, the, the task of bounding box detection is to uh, detect every object in the scene or rather i would say every relevant object in the scene and to there's a bounding box around the object so that you can uh, uh, you can you can obtain its approximate approximate size, but bounding boxes do not give you precise localization, um, and it does not give you any shape information, which is often necessary, especially when there is occlusion uh, in the scene. For this, you'll have to perform segmentation, which is the task of classifying every pixel uh, into whether it belongs to an object or not. You can see an example in, uh, in, in, in image B here, where every pixel is classified and uh, every pixel that belongs to a person gets uh, one color here, for example, and uh, every pixel that belongs to the table gets another color. Now, some, this uh, particular uh, form of segmenting uh, objects is called semantic segmentation, where you do not have a notion of instances which means that, you, you, that the system does not know if you're person A or person B, or it rather does not care. But often you need this sort of information, say for example, if you're uh, in case of autonomous driving, if you're following a car, you need to know what, uh, what exact instance of the car you're following and not uh, any car. And for this, you have to separate object instances, uh, which, uh, yeah, which brings us to instant segmentation where you classify every pixel and also separate uh, the instances of uh, every object. Say. So you can see that every person in the scene gets a different color, which essentially means that they, they belong to a different class. Or I, I should say they, they have a different object ID. They belong to the same class, but they have a different object ID. We are particularly interested in the task of instant segmentation for our work in the video domain. When we switch from images to videos, we have the additional task of uh, associating objects over time on top of segmenting every object in every frame. This means that an object, uh, if it is the same, would get the same ID across uh, throughout the video. Here you can see that uh, the, the people, for example, like they get the same color across the frames in this video, or, or for that matter, cars. This uh, poses additional challenges to the system because objects can um, undergo uh, dynamic changes. It can deform its shape. For example, people uh, often change poses and it, there, there can also be a lot of occlusion. And uh, this would uh, mean that uh, segmenting objects in videos is uh, much harder than segmenting objects in a, in, a, in a single image frame. Say for example here, uh, there are two people crossing the road and one person is uh, almost fully occluded. But we, our system should still be able to detect, segment and track them. 
Now, first, let's see how, uh, how this can be done. One possibility of performing instant segmentation in videos is to split up this task into multiple stages. So if in the first stage, we uh, perform instant segmentation at the image level. So for example, given a video, video clip, uh, such as the one given in the first, uh, first row, we, uh, we perform instant segmentation uh, using some uh, uh, instant segmentation methods such as mask RCNN to generate object proposals, uh, which can be seen in the second row. Now these proposals, as you might notice, have different IDs, uh, even if they are the same object uh, across different frames. Say for example, this bike rider here gets yellow color in the first frame, but the color is switched to green and then further to brown and so on. This uh, is not, not what we want uh, for a video instant segmentation task. So uh, in order to uh, uh, make the IDs consistent, we have to associate these proposals over time. To associate these proposals over time, uh, in the second stage, we, uh, we seek the aid of optical flow, which, uh, which essentially gives you uh, uh, a vector where each pixel moves. So it's, it's a motion model. So based on optical flow, you can identify uh, uh, the same objects by, by simply performing a walk. But the problem with optical flow is that um, it can, uh, it doesn't, it is, it's not good at long-term associations. Say, for example, if, if, if an object is occluded for quite some time, then optical flow might not be able to uh, associate uh, the object once it comes out of occlusion. For that reason, you can see here that uh, the first four frames get uh, consistent object IDs. And in the last frame, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the object ID is lost, essentially because it, uh, got occluded, uh, occluded by this car, by this green car here, and it came out of the occlusion and optical flow can no longer track it. For this reason, we need an additional step of global tracking where we use some system like ReID to uh, associate, uh, to, to perform long-term associations, which can fix the, uh, the problem that of optical flow hash. So you can see that this, uh, uh, this type of uh, segmenting instances in video has multiple stages. It involves multiple networks. For example, there is uh, a proposal network such as mask RCNN, and then there is an optical flow network or an optical flow model, which encodes a motion model. You, you also need an additional uh, global association model such as VID. And uh, this, uh, can mean that there's, there's a lot of hyperparameter tuning involved in such methods. And you have to rely on multiple different networks which, uh, which would make it non-end-to-end -end trainable. Now, another possible uh, approach could be something like this, where you, uh, you, you have a video input video clip, you encode each of the frames separately, and uh, pass it through a proposal region proposal network where you get uh, regions of interest uh, which is uh, uh, which gives you a likely location where an object object could be for each of the each of the proposed regions which can be thought of as a bounding box you you also learn an association association embedding which essentially associates each of the bounding boxes from one frame to another it's essentially a vector which is learned and um, uh, using something like triplet loss. And uh, these vectors are learned in such a way that the vectors uh, or the vectors that belong to uh, uh, belong to the same object would uh, would be closer together uh, in the latent space. And they, the, the vectors that belong to uh, different objects would be far away from each other so that you can um, essentially associate these objects. Now, uh, here, as you can see, uh, association is uh, mainly performed uh, uh, mainly performed between adjacent frames, and uh, such systems mostly use Siamese network to associate every frame pairs and then propagate the association throughout the entire video clip. Before moving on to stem sake, let's take a look at some of the popular. Uh, benchmarks in instant segmentation in videos. Uh, so here, uh, 
I've listed some examples from the three most popular benchmarks. The first one is called video object segmentation. Here the task uh, is to segment every foreground object and separate the instances uh, and also uh, segment them essentially. As you can see here, there is a bike and, and a rider. And these are the foreground objects. Uh, anything else is, is the background, say for example, the tree or uh, the, the, the wall, etc. So the algorithm here has to detect the foreground objects. Uh, it, it can be of any category and then segment them while ignoring the background, ob background objects, even if they move. The second benchmark is called video instance segmentation. This is again about, uh, this benchmark is again about segmenting instances in a video. But here the setting is slightly different. So you are given a predefined set of classes. So there are 40 categories which you're supposed to, supposed to segment and track. And if you have objects from any of these categories, you're supposed to seg your algorithm is supposed to track them. Multi-object tracking and segmentation is also similar to video objects, video instant segmentation, but the category list is different. So here it's more, uh, uh, it's more uh, catered towards the autonomous driving community. So you just have to essentially track pedestrians and cars. Now, uh, we consider these tasks to, tasks to be uh, under the same umbrella, where you have to perform instant segmentation in videos. While the methods that we've seen uh, in the previous slides, they tackle uh, just one task among these. And uh, most of these methods are heavily fine-tuned to it. This would mean that uh, a method which is fine-tuned for video object segmentation does not work for video instant segmentation, and vice versa. But we, uh, so this is potentially a problem with existing systems that they, uh, they can't generalize to other tasks which uh, involve, which have similar problem formulation. We try to solve uh, some of these problems with our proposed method STEMSEC. So this is a, a single stage end-to-end -end trainable uh, model, which is applicable for all the three tasks that we've, uh, that we've seen in the previous slide. Stemsec takes his input uh, a video clip of fixed length, passes it on through an encoder, which is uh, based on 2D convolutions, and further on to a 3D decoder, which generates uh, uh, embedding vectors in the space-time volume, which can be directly clustered uh, for the for the entire clip to generate uh, segmentations that are that are inherently tracked over time. More on how this is done would be uh, would be covered uh, in Ali's presentation, and I'll uh, hand it over to him to explain the method uh, and give you uh, an in-depth an an analysis of of STEMSEC. As my colleague mentioned, STEMSEC is a single-stage approach to object segmentation in videos. So let's take a look at the broad overview of the pipeline of our method. We are given a video clip, which is a series of image frames. And we give this video clip to our deep neural network, which has an encoder decoder architecture. And the output of the network is that at each uh, pixel coordinate in the video clip, we get three separate outputs. The first output is an embedding or an e-dimensional feature vector. The second output is a cluster variance for each pixel again. And the third output is a cluster center heat map value, which is normalized in the range of zero and one. So it's all right if it's not clear at this point what these outputs mean, because I'll be explaining this in the upcoming slides. Another way of looking at our method is that we have an input, which is a series of image frames, RGB images. So we have three dimensions at each pixel location. And the network is basically just a mapping function. It maps each RGB pixel value onto three, three different outputs, the embeddings, the cluster variances, and the, clus the cluster center heat map. Let's take a look at the, exactly the problem formulation, how we, um, how we actually segment these objects. Now our objective here is that the embeddings or the feature vectors for each belonging to each object 
should form a tight cluster in the embedding space. And we can actually uh, better understand this with the help of an example. So given the video clip that you see on the left, if we look at the embeddings for this video clip, the embeddings should look something like this. So here we have two objects in the video clip. The first object is the horse, and the second object is the human rider on top of the horse. For ease of visualization, we use the color green for the rider and the color blue for the horse. Now note here that we are actually creating this plot in the embedding space. So every point in this plot corresponds to a particular pixel in the input video clip. We define object clusters as Gaussian distributions. As you all know, a Gaussian distribution is defined by a mean and a variance. In order to compute the mean, we simply take all the pixel embeddings for the pixels belonging to a particular object and we compute their average. So in this example, when we compute the average of all the green pixel embeddings, we will arrive at the point view 1. And likewise, if we do the same for all the blue pixel embeddings, we will arrive at the point view 2. Now, if you remember from earlier, the network also predicts a variance value for every embedding dimension and for every pixel in the video clip. So repeating the same process, if we just average all the variance values, we can come up with a single variance value per embedding dimension for each object. And these are shown here with the variable symbol sigma. Now, we have managed to define a distribution for each object in the video clip. What we can now do is that we can take any pixel embedding in the video clip and we can compute the probability of that pixel of belonging to a particular object cluster. And the way we do this is using the very familiar formula for computing the probability of a multivariate Gaussian distribution. The vector mu is already known to us. Um, and we construct the covariance matrix sigma by just creating a diagonal of the variances that we just computed in the previous step. To train the network, we iterate through the Gaussian distributions for each object and we enforce two things. The first is that for all pixels belonging to that object, the probability of the embedding of that pixel should be greater than 0.5. And likewise, the probability for all the other pixel embeddings of belonging to this distribution should be less than 0.5. So in this example, if we are considering the green object, then all the pixels belonging to this object should have a probability greater than 0.5, and all the other pixels in the video clip should have a probability less than 0.5. Likewise, we can do the same for the second object. All the blue, with respect to the Gaussian distribution for this object, all the blue pixels should have a probability of greater than 0.5, whereas all the other pixels should have a probability of less. Now, here it is worth noting that for ease of visualization, we don't show you the background pixel embeddings, but it is understood that these background pixel embeddings should always have a probability of less than 0.5 for all the object clusters. So far, we discussed how our network is trained. During training, we have access to the ground truth segmentation masks for each object. So as mentioned earlier, we can just compute the average of the per pixel embeddings and the per pixel variances to derive the object cluster parameters for each object. But the problem is that during inference, we don't know which pixels belong to which object. And in fact, this is exactly what we want to use the network to do for us. So during inference, the way we determine the Gaussian distribution parameters for each object is a little bit different. Now, if you recall from earlier, the network produces three outputs per pixel in the video clip. The first two outputs are the embeddings and the variances. And the third output is a cluster center heat map. And this heat map is actually used during inference to help us find out the parameters for each object cluster. If we want to visualize this heat map for the given video clip, it should look something like this. For each object in the video clip, um, this heat map produces a value between 0 and 1. So it's basically a probability map. And it is, it is trained in a way that 
the probability should be high close to the center of the object and it should gradually decrease as we move further and further from the center of each object. So for this video clip, we will end up with two high points close to the centers of the person riding the horse and the horse object. To determine the object distribution parameters, we look up the coordinates at which these two high points in the heat map lie. So these, and these are basically the centers for each object. They are denoted with a tuple of three values containing the x, the y, and the time coordinate. And the way we determine the object distribution parameters is that we simply look up the embedding at the center, at the center coordinate. So um, looking up the embeddings at location C1 yields the, uh, the mean for the object cluster. And likewise, looking up the variance map at the location C1 yields the variances for object cluster 1. Likewise, we can do the same for the second object, and this should give us the object cluster parameters. The nice thing about our method is that we can use it to segment an arbitrary number of objects in a video. We initialize an object counter variable k. Next, we determine the center of this object by looking up the highest location, the, the highest probability location in the heat map. Then we define the distribution parameters for object k by simply looking up the embeddings and the variances at the location ck. After that, we compute the probability of every pixel of belonging to this object cluster. And then by simply thresholding these probabilities at 0 0.5, we can compute a segmentation mask for the kth object. Once this is done, we assume that all of the pixels that had a probability greater than 0 0.5 have already been assigned to object k, so these are then discarded from any further consideration. And then we simply repeat these steps. So we again look up the, high, the next highest value in the object center heat map, and we again de derive the object cluster parameters, and likewise we continue the clustering. We continue these steps until the highest probability value in the heat, maps, heat map drops below a certain threshold. We evaluate our method on three different data sets, and the underlying task for all these data sets is essentially the same. We are given a sequence of image clips, and we want to produce segmentation masks that capture each object in the video clip. Now these, these data sets contain a very, a very diverse collection of video scenes ranging from sports as shown here. Um, we also have a lot of animal classes in some of the data sets. And finally, one data set is also dedicated to vehicle driving road scenes. And our method performs very well on all these data sets. And for further quantitative analysis, we would like to refer you to the publication. So just to conclude, we proposed a single stage approach for object segmentation in videos. This is quite different from the existing multi-stage approaches, which first detect the objects in, in each individual frame and then have a separate mechanism for associating these object detections across time. We modeled object clusters as multivariate Gaussian distributions, and we created a network that predicts per pixel embeddings and also the variances. So the nice thing about this formulation was that um, we get the object distribution parameters almost directly from the network itself. So we don't have to apply any separate algorithm to determine them. This greatly simplifies the inference. It also speeds up our method and it makes it end-to-end -end trainable. Lastly, we evaluated our method on, our, on three different data sets containing a diverse range of video scenes and we showed that it performs well on all three. We would like to thank you for taking the time to listen to our talk.